are listening to Thoroughly Kinky. Thoroughly Kinky. Thoroughly Kinky. Thoroughly Kinky. Thoroughly kinky. With your hosts, Liam and Adam. Blazing on the sunny afternoon. Welcome to episode 9 of Thoroughly, Thoroughly Kinky. kinky. This episode, we're going to be covering the album The Kinks Are, the Village Green Preservation Society. Yeah. Adam is holding up his copy of the vinyl sleeve right now. So, Adam, to start us off, how does this album stand in the Kinks discography? Well, to be really prosaic about it, it, this is kind of, I would say, the equivalent of like a Sgt. Pepper's, you know, in terms of being a statement album, you know. Hmm. This is an album that... Ray had actually been working towards for two years with the sort of overall themes of vanishing England, everyday uh, English life, sort of all gathered together. And it's called The Bill's Green Preservation Society because that's the title song, which is all about preserving old ways of life, that kind of thing. I did hear this album talked up as the sort of grand statement. I read about the album before I saw a copy of it, and I was quite disappointed by the album cover, I've got to admit. I mean, what do you make of the album cover? I mean... First thing I get is sort of Looney Tunes. What? Like I'm imagining Porky Pig at the end of every Looney Tunes episode. He comes out and says, what's up, folks? What's, yeah. And... <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. But instead of Porky Pig, you've got the kinks there. That is amazing. Liam, you amaze me that you always manage to find something that in 30 years I've never even occurred to me. <laughs> I've never even... Or alternatively, you could call it a sort of psychedelic aura, sort of great ideas radiating out of the four. Um, it's yeah. this red. Not sure what to make of it other than it looks like an explosion of inspiration. Yeah. Them, a sonic boom of that's, ideas. That's a good take. And I've always been a bit disappointed, but to be honest, when I was hearing the album and it's quite grandiose title, I imagine something that's a bit more you know, ornate and complex and you could look at for ages, where to me this is just like the four of them there and it's got this concentric circles leading into a black hole and it's, a, it, I don't know, it's, it doesn't seem to have enough occasion. So I've also been a little bit disappointed by this album cover. I mean, it is a gatefold, uh, like that. Ah, okay, Adam's opening it and inside you can see an enlarged, it looks like an enlarged version of the same picture on the front. Yeah. Uh, which is a bit of a waste of real estate, really, I think. It's not, you know, repeating the same picture or a very similar one. Uh, and then the back cover's probably the best. Yeah, conceptually, that would fit better on the front because they're walking through wheat fields um, in nature. And, uh, yeah, uh, you can see a lot of grass there. Yeah. This has got a gatefold. It's got the lyrics of the first song on the back. There's definitely an attempt in the packaging to say this is, you know, this is a big album, this is a statement album. And it's the last album by the original group or the original bass player, Peter Quaife, left. Oh, so Peter Quaife, he leaves after this album. We've heard in previous episodes about tensions within the band between uh, Dave and Mick Avery, the drummer. That's right, yeah. Uh, but it's actually Peter Quaife who leaves after this. Is that something to do with the change of direction that this album represents? Well, not really. Actually, he really liked this album. Um, hmm. he Peter Quaife, who felt they didn't allow them much input, thought... Even though Ray wrote all the songs, he allowed the other members more input into the arrangements with this album. So he was actually very happy with this album. But overall, he felt like he wasn't contributing enough and just the interpersonal conflicts led to him leaving about six months after this album came out. Right, okay. This is the end of an era. With this, It's a sort of a, a beginning of a new era. It feels very different, and a, like a real statement, yeah, yeah. like you said, moving forward in a, in a new direction, conceptual yeah. direction, but also the end of an era with the end of the original lineup yeah yeah you said it's um a gate fold sleeve which normally implies a double album but this is not a double album in length so what's the deal there it's not no um it, actually at one point it was meant to be a double album have 20 tracks in it but that sort of fell by the wayside but yeah it's got 15 tracks which is quite a lot for a single album uh as i said he had a lot of extra tracks floating about which could have been included on a double album. And fans have tried to compile their own double album version of it. It's a bit like the opposite of when you try and slim White Album down to one disc. A lot of fans have tried to expand this to a double disc, which is easy to do with the number of leftovers. But uh, no, it's it's just a single album. Right. Quite a lot of tracks for an LP. 15 tracks. Uh, it feels like yeah. all the songs on this album are quite short. Yeah. 
And the Kinks, they generally do have shorter songs, but I feel like this is pushing that to an extreme where it's almost like you never have time to rest on this album. Many, many ideas packed on two sides. Yeah, totally. So with that established, let's move on to track one of The Kinks Are the Village Green Preservation Society, which is called... That's setting up for you, Adam. Uh, the, the, uh, the Village Green Preservation Society, yes. Indeed. Let's listen to it. Preservation Society God save the old duck For the bill and variety We are the desperate men Appreciation Society God save strawberry jam And all the different varieties Preserving the old ways From being abused Protecting the new ways For me and for you What more can we do? Okay, that was Village Green Preservation Society, track one of the Kinks Are, the Village Green Preservation Society. Um, So, by the way, I'm Liam. I'm the newbie to the Kinks. Um, Thoroughly kinky refers to Adam, in fact. Adam is thoroughly kinky. He's the (laughs) Kinks expert, whereas I am a newbie, a novice, and I've never heard this album before, before listening for it in preparation for this podcast. Yeah. And so for me, listening to this album, putting it on for the first time, as you said, the album cover is pretty nondescript. Yeah, the title's pretty weird. The first track reflects the name of the album. I was really a bit confused listening to this for the first time. It's unlike anything they've done before. I think of the Kinks as super cool, super edgy, super raw. (laughs) Whereas this is jolly old England encapsulated. Yeah. With some odd outliers like Donald Duck. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. This is pretty out there. What, so this was a surprise to you? Obviously, you said that, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, things have been turning this way for the last couple of albums. There's elements of comedy coming in and satire. Yeah. Um, yeah. Aspects of jolly yeah. old England creeping into their aesthetic. Yeah. But this seems like a very unironic, happy, yeah. frivolous, sentimental celebration of all that's English. And that was a surprise for me, thinking of them as such a cool, edgy group. It's interesting you say that because this was a flop when it came out. This failed to chart on both sides of the Atlantic. So it wasn't a great success at the time, but it's kind of become a cult down the years and it's become known amongst fans and casual fans as kind of like their, inverted commas, best album, you know. So it's grown this big rep as like this, if you have to buy one original Kinks album, you buy this one. And it, it, it's interesting that things have flipped around because I think a lot of people come to it now coming and thinking, oh, well, they're purveyors of small C conservative jolly old England, <laughs> you, you know, you know. So a lot of people come to the Kinks thinking of them as this is what they are. Right. Personally, I'm coming to them from the best of the Kinks, an album I used to play a lot. Right. For some reason, I never investigated their whole discography. It's kind of why I'm doing this yeah. podcast with you to learn more. And um, I don't think a single track of this album was included in that best of. Might be wrong. Probably not, because there was no there was no UK singles off this album. It, I think that was quite it, that was quite uh, uh, intentional. Actually, I think that, that Ray was like. I'm fed up to be a singles band. We'll just bring out an album with no singles off it, so people have to focus on the album. Well, actually, it kind of shot themselves in the foot. What happened was at the time, no one focused on the album, and there was no <laughs> single. You know, so but in the long term, it's been successful because this is the most uh, eulogized Kinks album, and uh, it's kind of a pet hate of mine. Uh, growing up, uh, I used to sort of sneer a bit when I saw casual fans who had the greatest hits and this album, and that was it, and they didn't have any other albums. Right, okay, so you have mixed feelings about this one. Personally, it was a breath of fresh air for me. We've heard a lot of that edgier kinks, that bluesier kinks so yeah. far in this podcast. Yeah. And for me, this is what I really like, which is super melodic, yeah. a carefree sound, swinging 60s sound, yeah. and also this very unique kinks element of high Britishness. And um, this is a great opening statement for this album. And yeah. Sets the stall for the album. It was very sort of perversely uncool for them to do this, to do, to do this song celebrating all these... Right, perversely uncool. And that's what struck me straight away, is that it's such a, a an odd song, a strange list of things, um, so, somehow comforting, heartwarming in a way, but uh, not at all what I expected from them to open up their album. They usually open yeah. up with a, like a milk, what was it, milk cow blues, something edgy and angular. 
Whereas okay. here we have the Village Green D, yeah. Preservation Society, a rock band setting out a stall for small C conservatism. It really does set out a stall because you can imagine there's been a stall. Literally. <laughs> Strawberry jam, custard pie, draft beer. This could be like a craft fair or something, you know. Um, yeah. Little shops, china cups and virginity. Some things entirely self-explanatory. You can find them in the Village Green Preservation Society stall, but other things less so, right? Like Moriarty and Dracula who are both villains. Fu Manchu as well, all three of them villains. Dracula is not even British. Donald Duck is uh, not English. But it's kind of like, it's almost given a picture of the sort of stuff you would see at a bric-a-brac brac stall, all this sort of stuff. Right. I did wonder about that, yeah. Early transatlantic pop culture all shoved together with a lot of English stuff from the first half of the 20th century. The sort of stuff that was maybe starting to fade with the modernism of the 60s being kind of brought together here. Musically, I quietly this one. It's it's a sort of it's a t- definite scene setter, isn't it? It doesn't it doesn't grab you and throw you along and say this is where we're going. It's like this is where we are, you know. Yeah, musically, it's just a few chords repeated, and then there's a key change in the middle. But uh, yeah, it, it's much more of a sort of like like Sergeant Pepper's opens up with Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. This is opening up with The Village Green, sort of setting the scene. Definitely. It's not a huge favourite of mine, but it works very well for what it's meant to do. It's entirely adequate. It's entirely, you know, appropriate for what it is. The little riff is good. The da 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 It always kind of reminded me of the riff from, do you know, the cricket theme, Soul Limbo, Booker T and the MGs. do 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 a very sort of commonwealth sort of uh, you know cricket it takes in the whole world but it's also very english do you know what i mean so yeah to me that's always had an echo of that because it's like this is a very english album but it's not narrow it's saying we're welcoming everyone in and we're giving it out it's very it's not an exclusionary kind of english exactly it's inviting yeah commonwealth english not a uh, empire english i would call it you know <laughs> We are the skyscraper, condemnation of idiots. For God's sake, Judah houses, empty tables of idiots. Serving the old ways from being abused. Protecting the new ways for me and for you. What more can we do? Okie dokie. Yeah, well, it sets out the stall, certainly, and there's a bit of a reprise later, so this sort of, like, packages the whole album. Let's move swiftly on to the second track, um, which is... Do you remember Walter? Walter, remember when the world was young and all the girls knew Walter's name? Walter, isn't it a shame the way... I really love this song. It's just so tight and sharp and delivers on everything the first track is promising. Oh, yeah, I love this one. It's in the pocket, isn't it? It's in, I guess this is like, you know, the first one sets the scene and this one takes off. It's it's an amazing performance and a lovely, yearning, panoramic melody. And, the you know, the theme is life-affirming, but very sad as well. Yeah, it's got this kind of wistful, remember-the-times-gone-by sort of vibe to it that I really appreciate. It's all about how he you know, the, the glory years he had with this with this young friend when they were young and then how when they're older they have, have absolutely nothing in common, which is a very sad theme, you know. And if I talked about the old times, you get bored and you'll have nothing left to say, it ends with. Do you know Hancock's Half Hour? Oh, well, a classic comedy. Um, yeah. I actually don't know much about it other than that. I mean, I'm I'm not the biggest fan, but it was huge in the 50s and early 60s. And I, I do know a couple of episodes. One of the most famous episodes, that's called The Reunion Party. And Ray and Dave, they've said they've watched Hancock's Half Hour. It's a great episode called The Union Party. And the first half of the episode is Hancock talking to his flatmate. He's invited his old army buddies over. He's talking them up about how they had all these amazing times. Now there was only one thing for it, hand grenades. We pulled the pin out with our teeth, rushed forward and threw them. 
What an explosion! Right on that ammo dump! I've still got a piece of metal inside me. I swallowed the pin. <laughs> and when they turn up one by one, they are the most unimpressive, sort of uh, very milk toast, and they, they, and also probably worse still is they barely remember anything. They barely remember his name. Look, I'm not Smudger, I'm Kippers. <laughs> are you? Well, I can't see very well with these glasses. Oh, yes, so it is. <laughs> I told you it was a laugh. <laughs> There's such a deep vein of tragedy to the fact that he talked up having this amazing life and then they just the reality is so depressingly mundane and I, I think there's got to be even if con not consciously they've got to have seen that episode and it's got to be somewhere in the back of the mind of the song you know because it's 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 mining the same scene yeah. you know that vein of pessimism that Ray Davies does so well I, I mean it brings it back at the end because it's got that do 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 that little theme that's that to me that's almost like it's Walter's theme when he was younger yeah, I love that slightly old-timey vibe to that melody. But memories of people can remain. It's absolutely, it's, it's absolutely amazing melody and absolutely amazing type performance. And, you know, what can I say? This is a 10 out of 10. This is absolutely one of the best songs ever. Let's move swiftly on then to the next track, track three, which is Picture Book. Picture yourself when you're getting on. Picture book. Wow. I mean, what a really absolutely infectious, beautiful riff that is. Yeah. Yeah. Got a great tight beat to it. And yeah, I really love this one. Yeah. It's a during, this is kind of like, I think this might have been a single in some other countries. This has definitely got single written all over it because it's such a tight pop song. And, you know, it's got, it's got a really strong riff, like you said. And, you know, slightly sad lyric about the fact that you know where uh, it kind of builds on the theme of the last one i think of looking back and you know, where did all the good times go um we're all older now but sort of like a something nice about it as well yeah i guess it's more it's not as sad as last track it's more sort of celebratory there's a slight wistfulness to it but it is more of a sort of it's almost like a bucket of the family all opening up a picture book together and laughing over old memories i mean yeah you know what people do now they're looking you know you're looking over like a <laughs> uh someone's Facebook you know, timeline. Uh, yeah, that's not the same, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, well, what, I, what I like about it is that you've got this really driving riff here. Um, but when you listen a bit deeper, there is this note of sadness and wistfulness to it. Yeah. You get a lot from re-listening to it. It's indicative of the way this album's going, where it's filled with a lot of well thought out, particularly well arranged songs. Uh, very tightly arranged songs where you can tell the sort of full engaged band performances. And you said that in this one, Ray Davies tried to give a bit more autonomy to his band members to help out with the arrangements. Do you think that that very tight sound stems from this freedom he gave them? I think it's indicative of, of that, definitely, yeah. We are moving swiftly on now to Johnny Thunder. So everybody tried their best Johnny vowed that he would never ever end up like a girl. Johnny Thunder rides the highway, moves like light. But sweet Helena just says, God bless Johnny. Johnny Thunder, track four. I also mm. really like this one too. 
especially how it always builds up to this um Almost in, indicative of thunder and lightning itself, lightning strikes. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a super melodic, tight sound. Really love the vocal delivery of Ray on this one. Uh, what do you think about this one? Yeah, well, this is kind of the first character song on the album. There's a lot of characters, so quite a few characters on this album. And I guess that helped kind of populate the village green, if you will. Mm. Um, what did you get that this that Johnny Thunder was? What sort of image did you get? First of all, the name Johnny Thunder makes me think of Johnny Whatever and the Whatevers. I thought maybe this might be Johnny Thunder and the Lightnings, a rocker. Yeah. Young, full of spunk. Yeah, totally. That's that's definitely what it is. It's going for, you know, the, the sort of 50s greaser, James Dean sort of archetype, isn't it? Rebel without a cause. Yeah. And the riff reminds me of, do you know, uh, Three Steps to Heaven by Eddie Cochran? No, I don't. Well, that's a very similar riff. Ding, 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 yeah. And Eddie Cochran, uh, you know, was an early rocker who died tragically in a car crash. And, uh, you know, I, I wonder if that's a kind of nod to that kind of thing. What I will say is, though the Kinks, people have this sort of stereotype of them as being very English, this album, it's not musically that English, I would say. I think there's a, hmm. a wide variety there's a wide variety of like quite cosmopolitan influences. I mean, this this one is not greatly English sound. It's 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 kind of like well, actually, interestingly, Ray said he thought it sounded like a Who song to him. Do you hear that? I am hearing a lot of Who on this record. Yeah, you could put it in the same thing as like how the Who were doing, you know, summertime blues at the same time. It's kind of like, you know, it's a sort of um, late sixties power rock English take on a fifties American archetype. I don't know. That's really pretentious sounding, but there's got to be something there, you know. <laughs> I'll allow it. So um, yeah, uh, Johnny Thunder, another cracker. I just love the momentum with which this album bounces along here. Yes. And we're already on to track number five now. What is it, Adam? Last of the steam power trains. Like the last. In the last track, the American influences predominate, surprisingly, ironically, on an album making its stall as a very English album. But yeah. here, more than ever, you can see this is American blues, although they're talking about supposedly English steam trains. Yeah, well, it's a perfect uh, perverse combination of like, well, I mean, the, the riff is lifted directly from Smokestack Lightning by uh, Howling Wolf. Same riff, it's kind of shamelessly just taken, yeah. I knew that couldn't have been original because it's such a classic one here. <laughs> Do you think it transcends it, that well known riff? Anyone, especially at the time, listening to that would have known that's where that came from because all their contemporaries were sort of like versed in the, the blues that way. But they can be so blatant about it because the lyric is something that and no bluesman would ever have sung about, you know, because it's about, <laughs> it's about, it's it's almost, <laughs> well, it's almost a sort of train spot or song. <laughs> like the last of the good old choo-choo trains. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think, I think he knew it was so audacious to combine the two that no one's going to say, oh, well, that's, that's taken from that because you're, you're putting it in such a different context that you get away with it, you know. Sort of you're doing a clever spin on that. This was inspired by a real life story because... It was only a few months before the album came out. I think it was in August 1968 that the last steam trains stopped in Britain. Oh. So this was inspired directly by that, you know. And I guess that sort of thing really got Ray Davies' goat as a small C conservative. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, he just wrote this uh, 
audacious song about it. it it's the longest song on the album i think it does stick out a bit it's not a pop song it's obviously it's just it's a different take on a blues song you know and it's so full-length blues song and just goes for it you know so it really it does stick out even on the album i would say you know by, by virtue of that right first i was surprised you said it was the longest it is indeed the longest on the album at four minutes and 11 seconds but i would say definitely doesn't feel that way this is one of the few songs in the album that we played live at the time and they could extend it up to like 10 minutes <laughs> live they made it a big sort of sort of rave up jam thing you know well, that riff is just so immortal and so brilliant. What's the what's the good pun? Uh, it really drives the pistons of this song. And it's like the, the the train is a character. It's you know it's it's a first person song. I'm the last of the good old puffer trains. Yeah, it's first person song from the perspective of a train. You know, um, <laughs> it's almost like childlike. It's almost like you know the, even the, it's like a cartoon. The the trains are alive. You know, it's like. Right. Well, I guess anyone who grew up with those things and could hear the sound of them as they were choo yeah. chewing away and saw the big yeah. plumes of, of steam, they definitely yeah. missed them when they went. You can still see how there'd be like a sentimental attachment to such a sight, such a sound. And the steam from the train would be, of course, heading upwards towards the uh, big sky. <laughs> ah, that's a nice link there because yeah. the next song is Big Sky. Big sky. Yeah. Let's have a listen. down on all the people who think they got problems. They get depressed and they hold their heads in their hands and they cry. People lift up their hands and they look up to the big sky. But the big sky is too big to sympathize. The big sky is too hard to give up. So that was Big Sky. And definitely vying with Do You Remember Walter for me, for my favorite track on this album. Right. just really like this, and I like how diverse it is. And I love those those two um, riffs you have, one very high, yeah. one very low. Yeah, A really nice bit in the middle as well. I guess it's the middle eight, um, yeah. which is like much different as well. Yeah. It's very uh, tender and sensitive. And so this song really has it all for me. Yeah, um, yeah, I think you've said <laughs> summed up pretty well there. This is the kind of panoramic view. This is the this is the big view of the village, I guess you could say, if panned up from the train. You know, you've sort of zoomed up and you're seeing the whole thing from up and above. You know, mm, um, yeah, and, it and does seem this, kind of deliberate there. Yeah, yeah, and it's this godlike figure, I guess. It's quite. What did you think of the spoken word delivery? It seemed really ahead of its time. I thought immediately of the the nineties blur park life. <laughs> spo yeah. spoken word bits um, yeah it, yeah it seems experimental positively experimental and i like yeah. it yeah it comes about halfway through the album you could say it's like one of the songs that's kind of the heart of the album you know it's kind of because it's this big sort of you know godlike figure that all see and i that's kind of sees all almost even though they're kind of they kind of can't do much about it you know it's yeah the, 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 yeah i really like that line that ray davies is walking on this album between making jokes yeah but also having a serious intent with this yeah. album yeah and I think that's best expressed here in this, this beautiful middle eight here where he sings, um, and when I see the world's too much for me, I think of the big sky and nothing matters much to me. Yeah. I'm glad you said centerpiece of the album because that's how I felt about it on my first listen and uh, on subsequent listens too. It's really just stood out more and more. You know, the quality on this first side, I think it's just been so good. And that continues here for the final track of the first side of the vinyl, which is... Sitting by the Riverside. Riverside, um, this is a, a great 
song. I really like this one. Some really nice jazzy chords in this one. Yeah. And you you got in the at a couple of points here this sort of crescendo with discordant elements creeping in here, a little bit like Day in the Life. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think this is a really strong one. Yeah, I, I, I love this one. This is this is one that does have a bit more of a sort of classical, more old timey English influence. You know, like you said, sort of uh, that is it. Is it a keyboard riff in it? It's sort of like it's quite sort of like yeah. That that reminds me of something I can't quite place it, but it sounds kind of like is it music holly or is it sort of like something else? It's definitely got an it, it's got a tincture of something something English and old timey that kind. Of, you know, almost yeah, like a definitely sounds sort of like you know, kind of a classic uh, music hall sort of sound you might hear. Yeah, or, or even like something you know you might hear as you know a seaside sort of I don't know something like that, some entertainment or amusement kind of thing. You know, right, the kind of thing where you know black and white minstrels might pop in at any moment. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that kind of old time. Right, yeah, I'm just trying to, maybe you know, best not to invoke the black and white minstrels because. <laughs> you know, this is this is an inclusive kind of a old timey idol. You know, <laughs> as we established, yes, this is inclusive yeah. Britishness. It does have a slight, if not sinister, sort of overtone. It's sort of like things are not quite things are distorting. I don't know, maybe you've drunk too much, or you've you know, or something's kind of yeah. It's got a slight kind of things just you know, like distorting, like you said, but edge to it, which comes in, you know, which stops it from just being a kind of you know. Whoopsie do, isn't it? or something. Yeah, yeah, kind of thing. It's got that tension to it, you know, which is good. I mean, it's a. I really like this track, but it's probably one of the slighter songs on the album. But that's saying it's one of the slighter songs is not itself a slight, if that makes sense. That you know, it makes sense. I agree with that. What have we got as track one aside two, Adam? Animal Farm. Take me where real animals are playing. Just a dirty old chair. Farm. You get so much out of such simple chords here. Animal farm. Uh, three very simple chords there, A, G, D. But yeah. it tugs on my heart strings somehow. Building on this atmosphere, it's built so well through the album, so well of looking back and memories and yes, uh, totally. you know, happy, simple pleasures in life, family and, and wholesome stuff. Lyrically, you get what you're promised, which is a song about the joys of being on a farm or visiting a farm or whatever, being amongst the cats and dogs. So I just think it's really tight. I love the vocal performance on this and it's uh, heartwarming. Yeah, I think you said it better than I ever could. Uh, definitely. I know this song is objectively good. It's just not a favourite of mine. Do you know what I mean? It's like... I get that, yeah. It doesn't leave you cold, but there's a limit to how much you, you love it yourself. I can tell it's me that's missing out. I don't I don't have a fresh take on why this isn't good. It's me that's got the problem. Not uh, The problem's, you know... <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> is there any interesting biographical information about Ray Davies or Davies? Did they grow up on a farm? No, I, they didn't. They grew up in Muswell Hill, which is North London. They went on trips in the country in the dad's car, uh, which there's a song about on the next album, but that's maybe not, I don't know. Um, despite the title, I don't think there's any we can't shove Orwell in there, can we? I mean, I mean that did stand out to me. Like perhaps it was a reference to that great novel, which was uh, published about a decade before. But uh, um, no, you can't. Ray Davies can't not have known that's what he was doing. But I don't think the song particularly has anything to do with Animal Farm, the the book. You know, sixty eight is also the year of the White Album, right? Yeah, because there George Harrison wrote a song, Piggies, Piggies, which was yeah. a very clear reference to Animal Farm. Which of these two albums came out first? Same day. They came out the same day. Are you kidding me? Okay. No. Ah, because that means they couldn't have influenced one another. Both those albums have similarities in that they consist of short tracks. They both embrace pastiche and 
uh, a variety of musical styles and, and here yeah a song about an animal farm but in different ways i prefer piggies got to say sorry <laughs> Anyways, um, Animal Farm, let's move swiftly on. We're not going to have time for all these tracks. What's coming up next, Adam? Village Green. Was there I met a girl called Daisy And kissed her by the old oak tree Although I loved my Daisy, I saw fame And so I left the village green. I miss the village green I kind of like it. How, how do you feel about this one? I get the feeling it's not a favourite of yours. Uh, uh, no, no, I don't, I don't love it. It's really. the first. It's the first song on the album you've not been. It's just notable because the first song on the album you've not been effusive about, which is, you know, uh, sticks out because it's been so good up to this point. La 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 la. la. Uh, yeah, I think it leans a bit too hard in the pastiche direction might be interesting the backstory to this one because this is the oldest recorded song on the album this was actually recorded two years before the rest of the album or well, most of the rest of the album this was recorded in 1966 oh 66 yeah okay it's essentially an outtake from the something else album oh okay yeah they worked on this album village green for two years on and off and he was stockpiling songs for it and this was the kind of first song that was going to be the title track, I think, when it was just called Village Green. Hmm. This is almost like the title track that got demoted when two years later we wrote Village Green Preservation Society, but was still included in the album, if that makes sense. Yeah, right. This is like the prototype or the blueprint. Well, it's different because it's... Lyrically, it's different. Musically, it's quite different because this has a full orchestra on it. You might notice it's the only song on the album that does. Yeah, the kind of strings coming in at the end. <laughs> song isn't quite majestic enough to really warrant those strings coming in at the end i would have preferred them on say big sky it's hard to me to think of the song without that adornment because it always has had that on it uh, or whether it would stand more or less without it i mean i quite like this one i think i think this is the first song the album i like more than you because i think it, what the album's avoided up to this point is it, it's got all this nostalgia but it sounds quite cosmopolitan and, and contemporary this is probably the first one that's just going full for old timey, you know, right? Yeah, like yeah. like green sleeves came to mind. Yeah, yeah, la 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 yeah. la la. Yeah, uh, it kind of reminded me of the more irritating moments of Queen's discography. Right. <laughs> yeah, I th- as I said in the last album, I think I've got a higher tolerance for that kind of camp than you. Uh, which is, uh, I mean, I, 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 I lyrically, it's it's song of like moving on from the village and lost love, and a, a bit like it's the it's comparable to Do You Remember Walter, I guess, because it's someone's moved on. Yeah. You know, yeah. They, there's no going back or they try and think about going back sort of thing, you know. I, I quite like the sentiment of it. Yeah, I miss the village green and all the simple people. I miss the village green, the church, the clock, the steeple. I thought that was a, a good rhyme there. And um, I, I appreciate it, but I don't, I don't love it. I don't love it, Adam. No problem. We can move on. <laughs> Okay then, so um, we can disagree on this podcast. That's, that's yeah. one of the best things about this. Let's move on to the next track. Uh, we are now track three of side two. Uh, Starstruck. Yeah. Starstruck. Baby, watch out girls, she'll be Because once you're in Yeah, 
happy, clappy. Um, Literally clappy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's an old timey again. Yeah, how, how do you feel about this one, Adam? Uh, yeah, I, I I like it, don't love it. Again, it, people say this is the uh, the song that fits least onto the theme of the album, which I'd probably agree with. Would you agree with that? It's yeah, like, Starstruck makes me think of, you know, the bright lights of Broadway, yeah. partying and dancing through the night. I can't imagine in the Village Green, there's, they've got many nightclubs. <laughs> so I would agree with that summary. I guess this maybe was put after Village Green, maybe, maybe I'm overly, overly think, overthinking things here. But because that was about Village Green was about the protagonist going to find fame, so this is about the bad side of that and how you know. Oh wait a minute! So what are you referring to in the previous track, Village Green? Is a character well, in, the, in that? In the previous track, Village Green, he says, "I sought fame, and so I left the Village Green." So I guess you could maybe say this is going off that. This is ah. you know someone going away to find fame in the big city kind of thing. Right. But right. Yeah, it doesn't totally fit with the rest because it is. It's a. It's a very sort of metropolitan sounding song isn't it you know bright lights dark nights big city kind of thing which kind of doesn't quite go with the rest of it you know and while we're tearing it apart i think that the chords are very repetitive here there's not a lot of development going on musically this was a single in europe not in the uk but in europe yeah oh they really shot themselves in the foot with that one so many great tracks on here i don't think it was a big hit or anything but um i mean i i I quite it sounds good i like it but i don't love it (laughs) Now, this is shaping up to be one of our longest episodes, so let's move swiftly on now to the next track, which is... Phenomenal Cat. A long, long time ago In the land of idiot boys There lived the cat, the phenomenal Cat, but yeah. a phenomenal track, Adam. <laughs> uh, I, I, I appreciate how different it is and the amount of colour it gives, especially to the second mm. side. It's a lunge into pure twee psychedelia in a way they didn't do much else of during this time or at all. And for that reason, I also rather like it. Yeah, especially like the sort of like little elf chorus that's going on in the middle. Fum fum diddly dum la la yeah, la la la. That's la. The- Apparently that's Dave singing that bit. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Um, there's a lot of Mellotron on this. You know the Mellotron, which is an early sort of sample sort of thing. Of course, the Strawberry Fields Forever is the kind of right. Uh, yes, usage, the Mellotron. Yes, right. Where it sort of played. It was a sort of early proto synth where you you pressed on a key and it played a, a loop of a tape sampling another instrument, which gives it a distinctive sound. You know, which is uh, all over this. Um, I like. There's aspects of this I really like. I like the sort of bridge bit, the the, the way the the sort of uh, chords are struck out with that. It gives it a sort of like epochal look into the history books kind of thing, even though it's talking about something quite silly. Dang, yeah. The way it's drummed, you know, it gives a sort of like, sort of like almost like historical kind of drama to it. He pointed out on the map all the places he had been. Yeah, I also like that. Yeah, flipping through the history books, some of the names it mentions here, Kathmandu, Sardinia, with the flute as well, this medieval sort of vibe to it. Do you like it the best of the kind of more... The trade tracks on the second side, the ones that are more genre experiments or a bit more I do think so, yeah. I think it's just got an atmosphere that the others uh, don't have. It's going to be very interesting to discuss the next track, then. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, which is track number 12 on the CD. It's All of My Friends Were There. I walked out onto the stage and started to speak. The first night I missed for a couple of years, I explained to the crowd and they started to cheer. Just when I wanted no one to be there All of my friends were there Not just my friends, but their best friends too All of my friends were there To stand and stare Say what 
wondered if I'd like this one, Adam. I actually do like this rather a lot. Wow. I, 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 it just makes me laugh a lot. Yeah. It's got a great sense of humor. Yeah. Reminds me a bit of Eric Idle. Yeah. In um, in uh, Life of Brian. Yeah. Um, and then in the chorus, it's got this really beautiful development of the chords, yeah. which yeah. I'd really like to highlight here. It's like, all of my friends were there. And his range as well, which is really mm. good. Uh, wait. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Bet you just did. I love that yeah. that change there. Yeah, it really yeah. just blew me away. It starts off understated and almost like a throwaway track. Uh, yes. that just comes out of nowhere and, and really surprised me and won yes. me over. And um, this is, I got to say, this is my favorite song on the album. This is, uh, yeah. Ah, well, I'm actually yeah. not surprised really because I actually it did stand out it's, for me as well. It's it's brilliant. It's um it's the contrast between obviously the the verse is very frivolous and comedic sounding, but it's the fact that it contrast that and then bam hits you with this chorus that contrasts so much and takes you to heights of poignancy and sort of communal sort of a feeling it's like it's, if i explain that right it, what do you mean by that like it's because it's called all my friends are there and it's like i, I always imagine when i see the chorus like a, a slow-mo pan across friends carousing at a in a pub or in a in a yeah. in a sort of large gathering or something, you know, it's so moving, you know, the way it does that. So it's very 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 cinematic. I think it hits that theme of the album of, of memories and memories that stay yeah, with you, where totally. it starts off as like almost like leading into a joke. Oh, so I was it was the big day, it was the biggest day of my life, it was the summit of my long career. Yeah, I drank too much beer, and then when he gets on stage, there's yeah. this kind of a moment of emotion yeah. that hits him, and you see yeah. him, he's looking around at his friends and their friends too and yeah, yeah it's something magical about this track i completely agree with you it's so magical i'm so i'm so glad you agree um <laughs> i thought we were going to disagree on this one because to me it's like big sky is a heart of the album i think this is a heart of the album too because it's about all my friends i hear all these people are here all together you know and the, the emotion it's such you're right the chorus chord changes are so good and the emotional weight is heightened by the fact it's contrasted with the silly bit. Mm, yeah, definitely. Okay, so following from All My Friends Were There is Wicked Annabella. Let's give it a spin. Annabella, something wicked this way comes, yeah. witchy, uh, dark, totally out of the blue. Uh, it caught me off guard. Yeah, I, I rather liked it, although I, I would say it's a slight track on the album. It's maybe a slight track, just in terms of like you know, only being one aspect. Like it's a, it's a, you know, it's the sort of village goth or something. You know, it's describing <laughs> village goth. You know, it's it's only describing one, but it's a as a song, as a performance. I think it's pretty meaty. You know, it's like. It's it's a very full band performance. You can feel mm. the band really go through in yeah. this. Come through this. It's 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 Dave singing it. This is his only lead vocal on the album. Yeah, yeah. Ah, this is Dave. Okay. Well, he's always had the slightly more acerbic, snarling, yeah. raspy, punky voice. I I see that. Yeah. I I think track side two has more sort of slighter, but they work together sort of songs in terms of contrasting with each other. Mm. So I think having one that goes full bolt for getting almost as heavy as you can for 1968 sort of um, one of my friends described this as proto black sabbath which, yeah i was thinking of black you know, sabbath with this yeah. kind of like very girthy riff here which is repeated yeah it's heavier sounding than that on the album 
and I think you're right that there's something like a more than a sum of its yeah. parts kind of thing going on with this album. Yeah, I think it totally works. A low key classic. Yeah. Let's move swiftly on then to Monica, the penultimate track on this album. I, I should die, I, I should die if I should lose money. There's something I like about it. It's like the band's together on this. Um, Ray's vocal's really good. Um, it's a sweet love song. I like how the chorus kind of comes out of nowhere on this. Da 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 da. Um, I do like it. It's all right. Yeah, it's all right. It's this. This is my least favorite song on the album. It's just a bit too slight. It's a bit too. I mean, it's, it, like you say, it's it's good. But it's like it's not up to the standard. Hmm. Ray outright said it was about the village prostitute, so it's how much of a <laughs> how much is, is about a love song is open to debate. Although, mm. but um, I mean, what it contributes to, I think, is that the last song, Wicked Annabella, you couldn't imagine that taking place anywhere else apart from nighttime, and this as well as at nighttime, except it's illuminated by a lamplight because she's under the lamplight because oh. she's a prostitute. Ah, oh, yeah, he, he sings because everyone knows that Monica glows at night. Yeah. So the fact they're placed consecutively near the end of the album, they do give a you know some almost mini white album esque sense of like the day ending, you know the 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 end of the day kind of thing. Yeah, not a favorite song of mine, nor I would imagine many people's, but it's it's it's, it's decent, but it's just not up to the standard of most of the rest of the album, I would say. With the end of the night, at the end of the album, this is the final track now. Um, what is it? People take pictures of each other. People take pictures of each other. Of a moment that lasts them forever. And the time when they matter to someone. A picture of me when I was just three. Sat with my mom by the old oak tree. How I love things as they used to be. Don't show me no more, please. La 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 la. This is one on first listen that I didn't really get. Yeah. I uh, didn't love it. And um, I kind of felt like, oh, that's it. That's how you're ending this. I felt like yeah. it was a bit of a, <laughs> a, a drop in quality from being yeah. a side one. But now after this discussion and having listened to it a few more times, it has grown on me each time more. I think it's got its own atmosphere and it brings us back full circle to the beginning, I think, yeah. in terms of the, the music and the, the lyrics. It ties a nice bow on things and underscores the theme of the album, which is memories and cherishing memories. And I think for that reason, it's a perfectly fitting end to the album. Yeah, you pretty much said it all there. Um, yeah, I think, well, this is obviously thematically similar to Picture Book on the first side. It's a bit photos, but it's a bit sadder. The lyric, you know, to prove that they really existed, you know, there's this sense yeah, that everything... there's something that really stays with me after a few lessons about that particular line. People take pictures of each other just to prove they really existed. People take pictures of each other just to prove that they really existed just to prove that they really existed People take pictures of each other And that, that, that resonates and uh, uh, is a good line. It's a hard line in what might seem a fluffy song at first. Was yeah, it, it's quite it, obviously the musically it seems quite light and it's got this sort of bouncy ska thing going on. But there's something the more you listen to it, the more it sounds slightly sinister. You know, mm. it because it's kind of got this sort of circular thing. It's almost like there's a slight, almost kind of like mocking sadness to it about how this is all this must pass kind of thing, and this is almost like a. Ring a ring of roses type of thing, you know, at the end of the album, you know. Yeah, something tragic about our habit of taking so many pictures, trying to hold on to something that will pass, 
and um, yeah, very fitting for that reason to, to finish this album. I really like this album, and I do feel it's more than the sum of its parts, because I could name albums we've looked at already, which had a greater number of tracks I'd listened to out of context. For example, I absolutely loved Face to Face. Many individual tracks on there I'd take out and listen again at any point. How do you feel about the legacy of this album, and does it deserve the high esteem it's, it's held in by fans? It does deserve the high esteem it held in, but I do feel it has come to overshadow how people think about the Kinks. Hmm. Because how it went was, the Kinks for a long time, they were known for their sort of 60s hits, none of which are on this album. Sort of in the 70s and 80s, they had a lot of sort of um, harder rock and sort of AOR type hits in that territory. As that kind of faded away and they became more of a cult band, Village Green has been sort of plucked from obscurity and it's the tables have turned. And now... I would say when people think of the Kinks, it's as Village Green defining them, which is perhaps not fair because they've done so much more at either end of that. Mm. But I can understand why it's a special album because it's very even. It's got a good concept, which is not too off-putting because they did a later concept album, which are more involved. Mm. This is just like, we're the Village Green Preservation Society. Come on in and give these amazing songs. Okay, well, I really like this album and I'm looking forward to hearing the material that was recorded at the same time, yeah. which we're going to cover in the next episode. Right, Adam? Yeah. And um, listener, if you want to prepare for that episode, uh, it's all on Spotify, isn't it? Well, what should they look up to find these bonus tracks? The deluxe 2018 edition of the Village Green Preservation Society. It's on the end of the first disc and the whole of the second disc of that. So tune in, listeners. For the next episode in which we're doing basically the kinks are the village green preservation society part two the bonus tracks yeah right so um until then um thanks so much for being here adam yeah thank you um pleasure thank as you. always and no until yeah. next time stay kinky stay kinky yeah thanks for listening to this episode of thoroughly kinky if you'd like to send us an email we'd love to hear from you write to us at thoroughlykinky at gmail.com You can follow us on social media too. You'll find all the links in the description. So that's all from us. See you next time on Thoroughly Thoroughly Kinky. Kinky.